Good morning. I'm Jim Griever. Today is December the 2nd, 2009, and we were at the John T. Nolan Rare Book Library at the Public Library of Cincinnati in Hamilton County. Today I am interviewing Tom Sweeney, who was in World War II as a Navy veteran, and I'd like to start this interview by showing you, Tom, a couple pictures of yourself. At what age was that? 18. Good looking picture. And here's another great picture of you in uniform. And this was probably taken at, at Great, great Lakes, Lakes. Yeah. Great Lakes Naval Training Center. Right. Outside of Chicago in Evanston, Illinois. To begin the interview, Tom, I'd like to ask you for kind of a general description of what the community feeling was like at the time you enlisted. You were going to Roger Bacon High School at the time. Right. And a lot of your friends were considering enlisting or being drafted. Or were gone, yeah. I, uh, I joined mainly because uh, I didn't want to get drafted. I wanted, to, I wanted the Navy. I joined a day before my uh, 18th birthday. Great. What was the mood of the community at the time, at home and at the uh, high school? It, it wasn't too much about anything that was happening, as I recall. Uh, it was just uh, things went on as they did before, at least in my family and, and, and people that lived around me. They, I guess they pretty much knew what was going on and, and uh, didn't, there wasn't much discussion. There wasn't much discussion with, with, my, with myself, with neighbors or people at school, although I did let them know that I was going to join the Navy uh, when, when school was over the June before uh, I, I uh, enlisted. Um, Tell us why the Navy was your preference. I always kidded about getting three squares a day and a clean bed to sleep in, but I just, I just wanted it. I, I, don't, I, re I don't know why, I, did, I thought it was something I would like, and I did. I, as, the, as it goes, I, 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 don't re I don't remember any bad times. Uh, I think of anything, I you know, just remember the, the good times, being there, being on the ship, being at sea, that was an experience the first time, which went, was from San Francisco to uh, Hawaii. And uh, it, was, it was exciting, but while, while at sea, which we were mostly at sea going from island to island and back to Honolulu, uh, it, uh, like I said, I don't remember any, anything bad about it. Except that it was a war. There was a war. And you yeah. were being shot at. Right. Well, of course, that didn't happen to us. I mean, on a ship, you know, you didn't get... I was on a troop ship. And, uh, Which we, ship was that? USS Bowie. I think it was named after Sam Bowie from Texas. B-O-W-I-E. B-O-W-I-E, yes. It was a troop ship, troop carrier. Right. So, from what I know about my Navy experiences, you were shuttling <coughs> Army and Marine Corps right. from Hawaii replenishment stations to the next invasion. To the well, we were shuttling them from like from Hawaii was the was where the commander of the Western Sea Frontier was, mm. and all the orders for the Pacific came out of there. Uh, we would be moving troops from one island to another. Uh, and the, the main invasion that we were involved in was, uh, um, oh, my terrible, the last one. Uh, I can't even think of the name of it. Iwo? No, no, uh, after Iwo. Tarawa? No, Tarawa. no. Iwo, Iwo was the second last. Uh, Saipan, Tai. Okinawa. Okinawa. My tell me. Okinawa. Yeah, that was the last one. So you saw service from what years to? 
40, what was it we figured, 40, 44 to uh, f up 46, 45, 46. What was uh, life aboard a ship like from morning to dusk? It, it wasn't bad. You, you know, we were, we were mostly at sea. And, uh, That's the worst part. <laughs> I, I, yeah, well, that, that, what, it, it, it didn't seem to bother me. If, after the first half hour out, I got my sea legs. Uh -huh. And uh, you know, the ship could do anything it wanted to do, and it didn't bother me. I mean, I could hold balance and everything. Uh, but it, it wasn't bad. Uh, um, when we had troops aboard, uh, they were congenial guys, guys to get along with. We, the only ones we never got along with were the Marines. Oh. And they, sailors, sailors thought they were cocky, and so did the Marines. So we, uh, we, I used to call them when they got on that, that red, white, and blue uh, outfit that they wear which was their dress blues, as they, as they called them. We, we had a contingent of, of a, marine, a marine officer and, and an aide that he had, w which would billet the troops when they came aboard. And occasionally he would be in his red, white, and blue outfit. And we called them seagull and bellhops. So they didn't like that. I have, a, I have a grandson who's in the Marine Corps now and just just went to Iraq, and I, he, he's a true Marine, and uh, I told him about the seagull and bellhop part. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't think that was too funny. <laughs> so, so they still don't like to hear that. What is his name? Mike Sweeney. Mike Sweeney. Yeah. Good kid. He'll make, he, he's, he's good ma Marine material. Wonderful. So it runs in the family. I guess, yeah. <laughs> On board ship, do you recall your uh, division officer? What was he like? Um, he was, my division officer was a pretty good guy. We, we had some pretty good officers aboard the ship. The executive officer, I remember him very well. His name was Joseph G. Ensensberger, Jr. And just a, a, an older guy, not you know, he wasn't he wasn't in his forties. I think he was older than that, but really great to get along with. Uh, the captain, no one liked him, including the officers. We kind of thought of him as that uh, that captain in that uh, the one that Quig. Quig, yeah. Everybody thought of him as that. You know, he would count everything, and and he was. Uh, he, 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 he didn't get along with the executive officer. At one point, they were sending, to, to correspond, they'd send notes back and forth with their order, orderly. They just didn't talk. He finally got transferred. He tra got, got himself off. Great guy. And the, exec the, 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 uh, the uh, captain of the ship didn't allow his officers to talk to enlisted people unless it was business. Not not just not stand around and 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 uh, you know talk. He 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 and they didn't like that. The officers didn't like that. You know, uh, most of the stations that I was assigned to during various things, it, well, there was an officer, and then I was there, and we you know would sit and stand there and talk and about whatever you know. I know one officer at the uh, that that was head of the uh, debarkation stations. We were four debarkation stations. Mm -hmm. And I was on number one with this officer, and his name was G.W. Amyot, A-M-Y-O-T. There's a few of them I remember their names, even how to spell them, and I, I don't know how I'm doing that, especially Joseph G. Ensensberger Jr. That's remarkable. Yeah, I, 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 can, I can spell his name. That's remarkable. But uh, I liked him, you know, and he was just a, 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 good, a good person, good person. And most of the officers were. They were good people. I had one officer one time. Every time a uh, ship would pull into a harbor that we were there, and it was on a weekend, and like a battle wagon or, or an aircraft carrier or something like that, 
I'd uh, get the signalman to signal over to see if there, there was a, a, a priest aboard. There were, were they going to have mass on Sunday? Uh -huh. And of course, they'd signal back that they were, and if they were, and, and uh, then I would have the word uh, passed over the PA system to all of those interested in going to church on Sunday. You know, uh, lay up to the uh, to the uh, br not the bridge, but the gangway at at a certain period. And there was a, an officer there. His name was Ensign Talby. Uh, when I came up, you know, you, you request permission to to leave the ship. You salute the officer of the of the uh, deck. And uh, he said to me, he said, Sweeney, he says, why don't you be like me? He says, don't believe in any god, and you don't have to go to church. See. <laughs> I've never forgotten that, <laughs> and and uh, when you know when he when he said that, I knew better to, better not to say anything, you know, because of course he could put me on reporter. I don't know what, but I didn't take the chances. But it was uh, it was uh, I enjoyed it. I, I really did. I, I don't remember the bad times, you know. I don't remember. Uh, the times that we were when we the invasion of Okinawa, I don't remember. I, I remember being there, and I remember there were like 1,500 ships in the harbor, and uh, that the that was the first time I think the Japanese used the kamikaze, mm -hmm. and uh, because they were using the kamikaze, uh, we couldn't fire at them because they'd fly just about even to the top side of our ship over the water to looking for what they wanted to, to uh, dive bomb on. And when they'd find what they were looking for, then they'd just go up and then back down and maybe again go down to smokestacks. I saw a, wow. I saw a uh, heavy cruiser get, get that, you know. And, and, and one thing I remembered, that I don't know how, how it ever happened, but the pilot of that plane and myself, we eyeballed each other. I wow. mean, I was, I was, my gun turret that I was on was just about equal, uh, uh, high enough that I, that we so, I don't know how, I just, I've never forgotten that. I mean, he was, you know, flying through him and, but again, we couldn't shoot at him because we might hit one of the ships in the harbor. How close were you to him when he flew by? When he flew by, about half the distance between here and that building over there. That's a pretty remarkable memory. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's that I should remember it. That, that I could remember just seeing him. You know, I mean, it was a split second, it's just like that. And of course, I was looking at, you know, I saw him, him coming and I, and I, you know, knew there wasn't anything I could do. But I had to stay on him when he, you know, I was I was strapped into a 20 millimeter gun. We had we had four of those on our ship. We had two uh, uh, 40 millimeters, and we had one five inch gun on the fantail. We were not a fighting ship, right. but we did have uh, some guns on there. Um, that what number turret was that? That, there are four 20 millimeters. Number one. Number one. You were strapped into that. Yeah, you, that was your GQ station. That was my general quarters, and uh, which was battle stations. And then I, uh, I had uh, I'm trying to think now. Uh, two other stations. Uh, oh well, the debarkation. I was on debarkation number one for for troops that were going over the side and. And we, we true, all troop ships or APAs had those P boats, we called them. P boats. Which were, I guess, P meant personnel. They would, and we had, we'd throw this uh, rope type. Cargo net. Cargo net over the side, and that's, they'd, they'd you know, go over, the, could go down that. And, and of course, uh, this, this uh, Ensign Amyot, he was the officer that was, assigned there and and I was signed to that and we would if there's anything we had to want to tell bridge or or any messages bridge had for us why well, I would hear it and then give it to him how many of those uh, landings or 
stops to load the P-boats with personnel did you come about? That was, this was Okinawa, you remember. Well, we loaded them, actually. Uh, Other landings? In, uh, I'm pretty sure it was uh, Hawaii. And we took them aboard there. And then, of course, we didn't know where we were going. Uh, that is, we, the, the ship company. Um, and uh, we'd take them in, you know, for the, uh, for the landings. What other landings do you recall doing? Well, that was the, that was the only one we were in on. Okinawa. Okinawa. Okay. Yeah, we were, uh, we were headed for Japan itself, Sasebo, Japan, uh, and we had the 5th Division Marines aboard. And there happened to be a Marine on there that, that uh, I went to high school with. Oh. Someone. At Roger Bacon. At Roger Bacon, yes. Someone uh, said to him, hey, there's a guy here running around with the name Sweeney on his back. And he says, Cincinnati on it. You might know him. Well, we, he did know me. We got together, you know. And of course, I made sure he was treated like a king aboard ship. He got everything he wanted. But uh, and to verify that that, that happened, I, I got in touch with him. He, he called me once here when in Cincinnati. He, he, ma he made it through. And uh, he uh, uh, told me that, uh, uh, I'm trying to think now where I was going. Oh, well. Oh, he, he, he verified his, where he went, the places he went to, what ship he was on, and of course our ship was the last one he was on. It showed that he, he got this over the, I don't know what the internet, or, yeah he did, the internet, and uh, told him that what, what, when it was, and, and uh, it, it didn't say where he was going, but it said he was verified that he was on my ship, and we were at sea. When and did this occur? When did this occur? In, I guess the, uh, well, that, the uh, Okinawa invasion was right after uh, Iwo. When did he contact you? I contacted him. Good. Yeah, I contacted, I don't recall why I did. On the internet? No, here in Cincinnati, I called him. But he lived in St. Bernard. Really? What's his name? I can't remember that. Okay. <laughs> So you could find him today if you. I have that. I, I have that piece of paper that he sent me, or mailed to me, with uh, you know all the places that in the ships that he was on, okay. and and the you know ours was like the APA one thirty seven USS Bowie, and that was on this piece of paper, and he he recalled uh, being on the ship. Well, of course, we we met, we saw each other on the ship. Fascinating. But as you know, we didn't have to invade Japan, and we took those troops in for occupational troops, and then we went to uh, uh, Guam and picked up Army people and brought them down and took the Marines out because they weren't, they're not occupational people. What was the food like on board? Pretty good, I mean, really. I mean, I had you know, I had a lot of friends on the ship. You know, I think the guys in the Gidon shop that made the ice cream. If, if I ever wanted some ice cream, I could get the great big thing full of it. And and, and one time, uh, for some reason or other, uh, tasting stuff, eating something that you got illegally, tastes better than if it's served to you. So the some of the guys discovered where there were cases of fruit and stuff like that where it was stored, and they had these hatches underneath bunks. And you lift the bunk up, and there's the hatch. Well, the hatch was locked, and they discovered there was uh, boxes of, of uh, peaches. And so we they got a box of these peaches and brought them up to our where we were, opened them up, and we're sitting there eating them. 
And all of a sudden we look up and there's the executive officer. And he says, he said, said are they good? And we said, yes, sir. He said, well, don't, don't let anybody catch you eating them. <laughs> that, that was this guy, it was Joseph G. Ensensberger. He, he was, a, he was a, a, a good guy, the type you'd do anything for. Was he actually an ensign? That's how. No, he was. He was a lieutenant commander. But his middle name was Ensign. Ensigns. Ensigns. E n s e n s s e n b e r g e r. Ensigns Burger. Ensigns Burger. Yeah. Sounded like Ensign. Yeah, right. No, he was. He was a uh, lieutenant commander. The uh, you mentioned the term gee dunk, and as far as I know, that's an exclusively Navy, maybe Marine Corps term. For why don't you explain that to us? What gee dunk? Means? Well, ghee dunk is, is uh, food and, and ice cream and pop and stuff like that. You, could, you couldn't get that every day. You know, you, you only, only were allowed to have it, uh, uh, you know, once a month or one, like, like cigarettes. I, got, I didn't smoke, but I got a carton of cigarettes. I, that was my first uh, introduction to cigarettes, because I got a carton of them. I took a pack out and I went topside and <clears throat> I, I took a cigarette out and I lit it, took a few puffs on it and threw it overside. And then I uh, got another one out and I sp smoked part of it and didn't, didn't like it and threw it away. And that was the beginning and the ending of my smoking. And I went and got the car. All in one day. All, all in about 10 minutes 10 or 15 minutes. minutes. <laughs> Because I it burned my tongue, but I, I didn't know that you know that's going to happen. You got to get used to it. Well, I thank God I didn't get used to it. But I took my uh, the carton of cigarettes and it cost a buck for a carton, and I got my buck back, and that was it. About a dollar a carton. A dollar a carton, yeah. And you you were I believe it may have been you were allotted one a month, maybe one every two months. I don't remember, but I got one. But a lot of times when we come into to the states, the the, uh, the guys that would work on the ship, they were uh, wanting if you had any, they wanted cigarettes. They were paying premiums. I mean, maybe two bucks. You could, you know, back then a buck was a lot of money, and uh, so they would uh, ask you, you know, if you had any cigarettes or anything that they couldn't get in in the states. We, we could get and we, we would, uh, you know, when we got back, we'd save it and then we'd sell it to, sell it to them when we got back in, into port. The term that I remember to describe the civilian workers that came on and off board ship for repairs, etc., we called them sand crabs. Sand crabs, yeah, yeah. Because they were on the beach all the time. Right. They were, uh, yeah, we, 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 we only, we went into dry docks once, I think. Just once. We didn't have in, to. In, in Honolulu. No, we came back to uh, to the states. Oh. That would yeah. have been Long Beach, maybe. Yeah, Long Beach. Yeah, we were in uh, the ports that we were were San Diego, Long Beach, uh, and San Francisco, and Seattle. Those were like four or five ports. There might have been more, but we didn't go go to all of them. So these were uh, very good Liberty ports for you. What, what do you call, recall about your experiences on Liberty in some of those ports? Uh, the one thing I remember distinctly was when I came back, we came back and everyone was, this is when we came back after being overseas for a year, maybe longer. Uh, everyone got Liberty. Mm -hmm. And before we got in, the word was passed over the PA system that all Liberties were canceled. And, you know, of course, everybody, we couldn't, you know, they'd, you'd get port and starboard liberty. And no one could understand what that was about. Well, what we found out was there were a lot of uh, ships you know, that, that uh, uh, battle wagons and cruisers and, and aircraft carriers that, that were coming in. And this was around Christmas time. And they wanted to make sure that uh, uh, all of these fellows got liberty being they were overseas so long. Uh, so uh, uh, they, they uh, canceled all of the ships that were in port or bases, canceled their liberty so these guys would have a chance to get a 
train or a plane or whatever, you know, they'd all be available for them. You mentioned the term port and starboard liberty. Could you explain that to us? Well, you have your, you have your port side of a ship and the, and the right side and the left side was starboard. And you had, you, and they had uh, a lot of things were fore and aft, like the, 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 the uh, gun turrets were, there were two on the port side and there were two on the starboard side. So you could identify them better by, you know, port size uh, gun turret or, or, uh, or a starboard side. Uh, you, you, everything you did on the ship, it was port. You slept on the port side or you slept forward port side or aft or whatever. It was all, that was just a, 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 a term that distinguished the area. How did that apply to the Liberty sections? It was, just it, it was half and half. We actually, if you were on Port <coughs> Liberty group or section, you actually lived on the port side? Yes. I see. I didn't know that. Yeah. And uh, then you, would, you would maybe <clears throat> get a weekend or maybe a week, mostly weekends. And uh, so then, you know, you knew that you, you had Liberty. I, uh, I didn't go on. I, first of all, you didn't, you didn't get paid a lot of money. I had thirteen dollars, I think, a month that I had in cash, and and of my pay, I used to have, buy a war bond every month, so that was taken out, and that was sent home. Four times thirteen would be uh, fifty-two dollars a month, and out of that, you bought a war bond. Yes. Which was, I guess, about twenty-five. Twenty-five dollar war bond, which I guess there were about eighteen dollars. I don't know, you know. There wasn't much liberty during the war in the Pacific, so you didn't, you know, the money you had, you, you, you just let it ride because you, you didn't have any place to keep it. So, uh, but we had uh, um, liberty, you know, some of the, when we go into the ports, we had it. I, uh, I, I wasn't too popular on going on liberty because I, all I'd hear about a lot of the guys would get their, what little pay they had, they'd go on Liberty, take all their money with them, they'd come back that night uh, or the next morning, didn't have a penny. They, uh, either they got rolled, the, the, the old story was a, a gal would approach them and, and, and they wanted to get to the other side of, of this alley and they, they would, would you walk and walk me through? I'm afraid to walk by myself. And they'd get rolled. They'd, uh, guys, they'd meet someone there to uh, take them, steal their money, beat up on them, steal their money. And and uh, but I usually when I went in went in on Mountain Liberty, I'd go in and uh, I'd go to a movie. Oh no, I'd go in and get a good meal, go to a movie, and then back back to my ship and uh, I didn't do much drinking I didn't I wasn't into drinking uh, I, I don't I don't even think I didn't in, in, get into beer and that till I got back home but none, nobody wanted to go on liberty with me because I they couldn't have any fun but the next time to go out on liberty uh, maybe I'd uh, you know loan them some money, you know, we'd, we'd do it my way. We'd go get a, a nice meal, go see a good movie, and then go back to the ship. But uh, there, and a lot of your ports that we went into, I remember the first time we went into Honolulu, it was a disgrace. I mean, it was run down and just, just looked like a junkyard. Mm. It was a mess. Mm. And I remember the uh, Royal Hawaiian Hotel, mm -hmm. it was, uh, painted blue, but yet I think after the war, it was, uh, it was pink. And I told people that, that, that it was blue before, and they'd say, no, it wasn't, it was pink. And I said, well, I'm sorry, but, but I proved it. And of course, the thing was, uh, where the paint, I think, came from, was just all the, you know, everything in the Navy, ships and all that was sort of a blue. And it was about the same color as the ships. And, uh, uh, but they were, uh, they were they were they were pink during peacetime, but I think I think they got back to uh, they got back to the blue. I think they're blue now. Yeah, I don't think I, I'm. Someone told me that. I don't know. I was there two or three times. I don't, 
I don't remember, but I knew they changed the color of them during the war. If the uh, liberty occurred on a weekend, would you try to find a Catholic church so you could attend a Mass on Sunday? I did, yes, yeah. I did in San Francisco, I recall going to one. It was a, it was a Catholic church, but they didn't speak English. It was like <laughs> French or something else, but at least like... Spanish, probably. Or Spanish or what have you. Um, <clears throat> there weren't too many places on the islands where they had it. You know, your best chance was a priest aboard a ship. And of course, we didn't have one. We did at one time have a priest. And uh, I used to uh, take care of things for him, get things done for him. And of course, a lot of them said that I was kissing butt, you know. <laughs> sure. But I was just, you know, and he may not have asked for special things, and I saw to it that he got it. When you go to a harbor, uh, for port calls and liberty, uh, such as San Francisco. Did you tie up in the harbor or would you tie up at a pier? Uh, mostly in the pier, drop anchor, tie up to one of those buoys. And take a liberty boat in. Yeah, we, well, we, we had boats on our, on our ship that we would go in on our own boats. The pea boats. I the pea boats, yeah. I remember one time coming back off liberty I got on the wrong boat because you know they all look they all look the same. They're identical. Yeah, they're identical. And uh, uh, I got back, you know, to the to the ship, and of course, you know, went board, saluted the officer of the deck, request permission to come aboard, and all that. And, and uh, nobody, no one said anything to me. No one recognized me. I didn't recognize them. But when I went down to look for, you know, get in my bunk. I thought, well, I couldn't find it. I mean, it was there, but that wasn't mine. I knew it wasn't mine. So I went topside, and then Chorsey told me then that they were looking for me because I, got, I was on the wrong ship. So they took me to my ship. What port was that? That was in, uh, let me think. Uh, it was out in, in, the, uh, out in the Pacific. It might, it might have been Hawaii. We never pulled into the docks of Hawaii unless we were taken on stores or, or something. But, uh, Those returning Liberty boats from port calls and Liberty calls could be very raucous groups. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Sailors fighting and... Oh, there was fighting, yeah, there was... Uh, Brawling. A, a lot of fighting. Uh, and of course, I, I didn't engage in any of it. You know, they were just... Uh, over stupid things, you know, they get in a get in an argument. After a few too many beers. Yeah, and it was hard enough standing up after having too many beers than with just being on that on that pea boat because that wasn't smooth. That would bounce and rock, you know. If and, and the Atlantic was the was uh, well, we were in the Pacific, so the Atlantic was rough. The Pacific was calm compared to the Atlantic. What uh, what you like best, uh, particularly one incident or event or experience on board ship? What what did you like the best that you really enjoyed, if anything? I guess they're about the only thing you could like. Uh, I mean, the food was good in that, but, but movies. Movies. We have <clears throat> they put up a very big piece of canvas about four times the size of that wall, and tie it to the booms, you know, and then they'd uh, they'd. Uh, uh, from the from the bridge or the one deck below the bridge, it had the camera, and they had the movie, and it started, I think, at low 800, maybe later. Uh, but mostly we had to wait for the officers before we could, and they didn't and they didn't start it till the last one got there. So finally, that, that got to be old hat, you know. So the officers had to be there at 0800 if they wanted to see it because they weren't going to hold the movies up. And uh, it was uh, all good movies. We'd get them at the only time we got a change of movies was at a, at a port. And we weren't in ports that often, but when we did, we could exchange them for a, a new set of movies. Um, <clears throat> I can remember seeing movies at sea, which was always a special event. Do you ever recall having underway replenishments at sea? 
with an oiler, would put the oh, hoses yeah. over. Oh, yeah. Now, where was your uh, GQ station on that? Um, I didn't have anything. I wasn't involved with that. I had uh, general quarters. I had the uh, debarkation station. Yeah, let's see, general quarters and debarkation. Those were about the only two. So you didn't have, you weren't called for an underway replenishment station? No. To man the hoses that came over to no. refuel you? No. No, I didn't have that. That was always an exciting event. <coughs> yeah. yeah, I remember when we <coughs> pulled into uh, Sasebo, Japan, mm -hmm. when we were, we were headed there for the invasion, so we, we went on to Sasebo anyhow. And uh, the, uh, um, when we pulled in there, uh, you have the line, it's not, it's not a rope. The line is about like this thick. A rope is like a clothesline, you know. And they would tie the clothesline to the line, that, and, and then it would, you, we would, uh, it, they had like a ball, they called a monkey's fist. Monkey's fist, right that they would uh, tie that at the end and, the, and they'd shoot it over to the dock and they'd get that and then they'd pull, pull the uh, uh, line in to secure the ship to the harbor. Well, when we shot that over the first time, those, those Japs on that dock, they took off. I mean, they, <laughs> they thought they were getting shot at. Yeah. <laughs> And another thing I recall when we pulled in, you know, I, I and a couple some of the other guys threw candy bars to them. Really? To the to the Japs, and uh, and I'm and I, I remember thinking to myself, I wonder if this was turned around and it's the other way, would they be throwing candy bars to us? Sure. And I don't think so. I don't think so. So that was probably uh, early fall of 1945. Some some time around there, yeah. What was the uh, what was your experience in uh, Sasebo like? Did you go on Liberty? I did. It was uh, it was it was okay. You know, there wasn't everything. Everything was Japanese. I mean, everything, whatever you went. I recall getting on a train, going to uh, Yokohama, and when it pulled into the to the where we were, it was it was just packed with Japanese. And they made them get off and let us get on, and we had a seat. And I always felt bad about that, you know, that we, mm -hmm. that we, that we did that. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and they were scared to death of us. They didn't say a word, you know. Uh, and, and after a while, when we'd come back, a lot of the guys had girlfriends. Japanese girlfriends. Japanese girlfriends, and they'd be there waiting for them. And some of the guys on the ship would walk up, you know, and they'd say, you, you know, you butterfly, you butterfly. And I said, no, me no butterfly, me no butterfly. Well, a butterfly is a girl that would flit from guy to guy. And they were, they were true to the guys that they, they uh, you know, the guys that they met. Right. And, and yeah, and uh, this chief on my ship, uh, who was over me, he had a girlfriend, and uh, she was pregnant, but not by him, and she wanted to get some, had a Sears, Sears and Roebuck catalog, wanted to order some diapers and stuff like that. He didn't, he didn't know how to, he didn't know how to, he, he couldn't fill it in. He didn't know how to do it. So he asked me if I would, <laughs> he, but they had ballpoint pens were, popular way back then, just when they were popular, he had about eight or nine of them in his pocket, but he didn't know how to use them. And I, you know, I thought, and, and, and if you go to write with him, you want to put down, you went to write, no, no, wait, wait, wait. And so he put some heavy cardboard or something there because he said you damaged the ball on the point. So I didn't, you know, that was the first one I had in my hand. But the, uh, the girls, the, that was, uh, you know, they just, uh, uh, you know, they say, you know, you butterfly. Well, they, they say, no, me no butterfly, me no butterfly. But they were, they were the, the guys, when, when they left, they came back, they were there waiting for them. They'd tell them approximately, I don't know how they knew when we were going to get back, but they were there waiting. Well, uh, you were about 18 at the time. Yeah. And uh, did you have any apprehension about 
being attacked, being the victors, entering this occupied land? No. None at all? Not at all, and, and I wasn't the least, when I was there in Tokyo, I was in Tokyo, and I was in Yokohama, uh, I had no qualms about uh, getting, you know, going in, getting off the ship, walking around, mostly it was walking, they, their taxi cabs were run by coal, and the, like coal. A, they have coal, they have in the back, back, back of it, they have the coal burning, the burning coal would somehow create energy for the engine to run. And uh, they were little, little cabs, you know, it was just a, I was very uncomfortable in one. A coal burning taxi a cab coal, in Japan. Yeah, coal burning. But uh, I, uh, the only place I went to eat was at, you know, at a USO. They had some places set up where you could come and eat and whatever. That was about the only place I ate. I never, I wasn't into Japanese food at the time. Uh -huh. So any of the eating I did, I did aboard ship. And, and, you know, before I, or when I got back or what have you. Sasebo, as I recall, was in the southern part. Southern tip of or Japan. bottom part of Japan, yeah. <clears throat> was the uh, subject of the uh, atomic bomb discussed at all amongst your peers when you were in Japan? Well, I, I, I wasn't there. See, that wasn't dropped to when? 45. Was it 45? Mm -hmm. August of 45. No, I guess maybe that's part of the reason they were scared to death of us, too. And they were told all these things that we would do to them, the women and the, and the men and what have you. And, uh, you know, they never, they were very polite. And uh, I know on the islands, a lot of them were in those caves and wouldn't come out, and they were afraid to come out. So I'm sure a lot of them died in there because they were told of the, what we do, would do to the women and the, and the girls and what have you. You were aboard the uh, USS buoy APA-137 mm -hmm. at the time that that bomb was dropped the first time and then the second time. What was the general opinion of your shipmates about they that? Were, they, were, they, were, they were related. They were related, uh, you know, uh, that, that they did drop them. And of course, when the war was over, they were, were excited. Prior to that, were you anticipating the invasion of Japan? There wasn't much, even, even though we were on our way, we didn't know it. See, they don't tell you where you're going. You know, maybe the executive officer and the, and the captain and maybe one or two, not, not many people knew because it definitely you, you didn't know where you were going at any time when you were in port. You know, so you <coughs> didn't accidentally or bragging where you're going or what have you get out. But uh, I don't ever recall being afraid. And, uh, you know, it's just wasn't much to do on a ship at sea. <coughs> but. Uh, Very boring. I, yeah, yeah. <coughs> President Truman's. Uh, major decision in his administration was the decision oh, yeah. to drop the yeah, bomb. Yeah, he, but that saved a lot of lives. A lot of lives. Uh, I, I On think, our side as well as the Japanese side. Oh yeah, yeah. They would have, would they, the estimate for us I think was around a million. A million? Yeah, soldiers, army service personnel. And, and the thoughts were that they would have fought to the last man, woman, or child before they'd let us take their country away from them. So they, they did the right thing for themselves. And thank God they, you know, they, they surrendered. Because I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be here today if they hadn't, if we had to. And we were on our way for the invasion when that was going on. I mean, this, you know, I, I don't remember. I know that's where we went with the troops that we had and they were Marines. And they, when they knew that's where they were going on an invasion, but they didn't know where. 
So you pulled into Sasebo? Yeah. With the Marines on right. board? Right, yeah. Where was the uh, USS Bowie at the time when the armistice was signed in Tokyo Bay? Uh, I think General somewhere Garfield. around Guam. We made a lot of trips to Guam, moving uh, soldiers and, and Marines around, service personnel around. Guam to different, you know, Saipan, Tinian, Iwo, uh, the Philippines, places like that. We, there was a lot of movements with, with uh, the Navy, with ships taking people to various islands. So at the time, after you went to Japan the first time, you got orders to be released from active duty, presumably. Right. What was the experience involving that? You were on board and everybody was released at the same time or you were back in Hawaii? Pretty much so. The ship, we went, we went into Norfolk, uh, Virginia, uh, and that's where we were released. So you went all the way from the west coast <coughs> to the east through the through Panama, the Panama Canal. Canal. Yeah, yeah, that's a long transit. Yeah, and uh, I when not, when I got first we were all separated from the ship, and they sent us to various like me. I had like three months, I think, to go three months, four months after you arrived in Norfolk. After we arrived there, and then they sent me to place out in in Seattle, a Navy station in Seattle. And then I got out there and I, you know, I had like three, four months to go. So I spent three, four months there. Then they released me and let me go home. And you know, and here I'm in my backyard over here, you know, in Norfolk. I could never figure that out. Did you but get back to Cincinnati when you were in Norfolk? Once. once. Yeah, I got liberty once. Yeah. I got a uh, week's liberty. And that would be the Navy way to send you back to the coast yeah, you came yeah. from. Just, just, you know, and, and then there were two brothers there that, that uh, together we bought a 1932 Hupmobile or something. It was a Hupmobile, I remember that. And, <laughs> and, and we went, they, they lived in, in uh, Minneapolis. <clears throat> and so I got that far with them. Uh, From Norfolk to, to no, Cincinnati, and they were know, going to Minneapolis. Well, no, I was, uh, they oh, I was out Seattle. in Seattle, Seattle home. And uh, they, uh, uh, at one, I think Butte, Montana it was, it threw a rod, and couldn't, we couldn't get anybody to fix it for us. So we got underneath the car, took the, whole, took the rod out, and uh, came back and had to leave the windows down because then it was just burning up oil. We had to, instead of carrying gasoline in a can, we carried oil because it was burning the oil so bad with the, with the cylinder missing, you know, and, 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 and we had to leave the windows down and it was cold, you know, at, in, at night. So uh, it was a miserable trip from, and when I got to, to, to Minneapolis, then I took a train home. And, to, and, and went to, um, what was that station down there on Spring Grove Avenue? Uh, Winton uh, Place? Huh? Winton Place? Yeah, but they, uh, have it, it had a different name. Maybe it was the Winton Place. But that's where I, and I lived in Avondale at the time, so I got off there and took a streetcar up Mitchell Avenue. I lived on Rose Hill Avenue and walked through, and my brother Walter was r running through there. He was running because he was late. I could tell for school he didn't even have time to stop and talk with me. Really? But he was on his way to school. And uh, when, I, when I got home, uh, the story I always remember was what I still had the key to, my, uh, to the front door of the house. And you, never, you had to open the one door and then you got into the vestibule and you opened the other. <clears throat> And I could hear my dog on the other side barking, just jumping, you know, yelp, yapping, yapping. And her name was Dixie, and she's a Boston tip bull. I have one now, my daughter had one now. Her name, when I saw her, when she bought her, I saw her. 
And she said, uh, you know, she just came and jumped up to me and I said, Dixie. And my granddaughter said, Grandpa, her name isn't Dixie. I said, yes, it is. But anyhow, this one, when I went home and she was at the door and met me at the door, <clears throat> and they can jump this high, Boston Terriers can really jump high. Uh -huh. She jumped up in my arms and she died. Died? Had a, had a, had a heart attack. She was so happy to see me. You know, my mother used to write me and tell me that Dixie's still looking for you, you know. And I never said goodbye to her because I didn't, I was, you know, the dog slept with me. This was my, you know, my life. This one here sleeps with me. She's in bed, you know, just right, right up, can't, just get snuggled right next to me, you know. I'm so tight I can't even move. But, uh, she, that was, I'll, I'll never forget that. I, so that was a sad moment. Tom, I uh, understand that you have a lot of your letters or correspondence that occurred from the time you were on uh, active duty with the Navy in the South Pacific to your home. Could you tell us a little bit about that routine? Well, my mother kept I, every letter I wrote her, and of course every letter she wrote me I kept. And I just wrapped them in the bundles, and then periodically I'd send them all back, you know, through a, in a package, but uh, I still have some of the letters. I, you know, open them up you know, that my mother wrote. You still open them and oh, I still you, open them and I read them. You, you know, read them. yeah, yeah. And tears That's come to my wonderful. eyes. That's why. Uh, but my mother used to write me every day. I don't, I don't know where she. You know, she always her her letters are like four pages, you know, like a story. And uh, I used to feel sorry for some of the guys at mail call. They never got any mail, or they never got any packages at Christmas. And I'd let some of them open my packages, you know, let them have what was in there. Uh, because, you know, there's a lot. I mean, my mother we would send them stuff. Loretta Ebner, who had Loretta, Loretta's food shop there at Paddock and uh, Reading Road. Uh -huh. She would sent, sent me a great big box for Christmas, you know. And she had one of the things in there was that she put a piece of a, 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 a uh, Limburger cheese in one of the cans and sealed it, you know. Well, when I opened it, whoo, did that stink, see? And the guys wanted to, get, wanted to get it and throw it, you know, throw it overboard. And of course, I had to keep it on myself. I couldn't put it anywhere because they, they would have done that. And I looked, and she sent me some bread with it too. You know, Limburger on rye was really good. My mouth is, is juicing up now just thinking about with it. With a little piece of onion. A little piece of, a bit, well, Mecklenburg's was famous for their that's, rye. That's a Cincinnati tradition, oh, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Limburger cheese with a big piece of onion. Big and piece the rye of onion. bread was about bread. that big, you know. And a burger beer. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah, Stein of beer. But they, I, I think I took it and put it, I took the end off of, we had these great big air ducts on the ship, you know, because it was kind of hot out there and it was forced air and it was blew pretty hard. And I took the end off of the duct and I put the Limburger cheese up in the duct. I, I don't recall that anyone, anyone smelled it, but at least I kept it there because I couldn't, didn't have a place to refrigerate it. So, uh, but I, I enjoyed it. No one in my family will touch it, Limburger, Limburger cheese. I'd like to be on record of letting you know that I'm a big fan of Limburger cheese also. Yeah. And my children also like would it. leave the room when oh, I opened that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I Glass jar of Limburger cheese. Yeah, it was good. It was, with the onion and all, it was good. It was delicious. Yeah, it was. Can't it was imagine. a real Cincinnati tradition. Right. And my mom and dad had it. Yeah, they, they liked it. So, And I was one of the kids. I don't know that all of them made it, but I was one of them that did. What were your brothers doing at that time during while you were at war? Um, Jake was in the... Uh, he was in the... Uh, I'm trying to think. Was he in the automobile business then? Let's see. If I was 18, he was 22. He might have my dad, yeah. Uh, and uh, in that business, I, when I got involved in it, 
I started, you know, washing cars, changing tires, doing all that. And you then, went to work for him when you got home from the right, Navy? Right, yeah. When I Next went, day, or did you take a day off? Well, when I got home, uh, I, I went, into, went into the business, not with Jake. Carl Bossy, he was a guy that worked for Jake. And uh, we opened up a place on Reading Road that was my, but where my dad opened up. It was a sign that says Walter J. and Jake Sweeney's on Reading Road there by William Howard Taft. And it was a small place. And uh, then, the, you know, then they went, they wound up down there at, uh, I think, 12th and Reading Road. There's a lot right on the corner. And uh, then it expanded to different places out in the valley and what have you. And I noticed that your diploma from Roger Bacon High School said uh, May 27th, 1947. So you went back to Roger Bacon? I went back and, and, and graduated from, you know, took my exam there and what have you. Father Jordan, who was the athletic uh, uh, priest, you know, each, the athletes had a priest that was, oversaw them, the, you know, the basketball players players and football players and what have you. And uh, he, uh, um, I'm trying to think, again, I forgot where I was going. Oh, when I, when I, when I came in to take my te exam to get my diploma, mm -hmm. he had my papers and everything. And he says, Tom, here, here's the papers and everything. He said, you can take your, your, te your, your test here in, in my office. And he said, uh, if you don't know the answer, there's a book right there. <laughs> so, so he was a great guy, this Father, Father Jordan. I well, mean, as a uh, conclusion to our interview, Tom, I'd like to uh, thank you for your extremely loyal and patriotic service to our country in the form of being in the U.S. Navy. And I'd also like to thank Dennis Daly for being our cameraman today. Thank you very thank much, you. Dennis. And this concludes our interview. Thank okay. you very much. All right. I, I, it went kind of quick. Good afternoon. I'm Jim Griever, and I'll be conducting the interview with Mr. Thomas Sweeney today. This is a continuation of an interview we've done previously. And Tom, it's great to have you back today. Our cameraman today, January the 14th, 2010, is Dennis Daly from the Public Library of Cincinnati and Hamilton County. Tom, let's go back to uh, <clears throat> your days aboard ship on the APA-137 USS Bowie. Is that right? Right. And the final days, for instance, it apparently, according to this document, you had a, uh, may have had a, uh, what's referred to as a uh, captain's mast. And uh, this letter that I'm referring to shows that uh, on 6 October 1945, the offense committed is stated as being inefficiency in performance of duty and false muster. <laughs> and the punishment for that was reduction to the next inferior rating. Why don't you tell us about that, how that came about? Well, we had uh, at various times when we were in certain ports, they would give us some liberty. But basically, on some, in the islands in the Pacific, it wasn't uh, it wasn't a big deal. We just got off the ship and got our feet on land. Um, but we had, uh, I, I got this liberty and, and uh, um, we, when the liberty was over, it, it, at, what it was was the liberty turned into a beer party. That's what it was. I mean, not that we had a lot of beer, but we had a, got, had a few beers that were uh, the Navy kept uh, at various places on shore. And this was in Enlady in the Philippines. And uh, um, upon going back to our ship, I, I was responsible for the people under me. And uh, I had, uh, and then there was a chief over me that also was responsible when they, we got back on the ship and he mustered everybody aboard ship as being present and accounted for. And uh, the next uh, um, day, we had muster on station, so I had to go up and report and account for everybody that 
was under me. And this one a sailor by the name of Gilreath was his name, he uh, uh, wasn't there. You know, I, I asked him, to, I, I had to go report to the captains at the captain's um, um, muster that morning. And I, I didn't see him, so I had word for him to lay down to the ship's laundry. And he didn't show up, so then I went out looking for him. And I couldn't find him anywhere, so then I went up to the muster and uh, I reported him missing. And uh, because I, 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 to this day I believe that because I was low man on the totem pole, there was an officer, then a chief, then me, I was the one that got blamed for it all. And yet I was the one that discovered him missing and I reported him missing. And I, I, I was up for an, a, a increase in, in my uh, rate and uh, not, and I had to wait. I was waiting for a certain many days to go by before it became official. I was like about five, six days, and would have been official. So I not only lost that rate that I was entitled to, but I lost another rate. So I went from from seaman uh, first down to seaman deuce, and uh, I got I got busted. And uh, I remember that I remember the next day uh, when we were, everybody reported for work the work that were under me. This one kid, I told him all what started to tell people what to do, get over here and do this or whatever. And the one guy says, "I don't have to listen to you anymore. You're a seaman deuce." <laughs> well, I gave him a left without thinking, right to the right to the jaw, and he I knocked him out. And I I could have got busted for that because you you know, you just don't fight. You don't start fights or anything. But I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. And I, it should have never happened to me. May I uh, quote from a letter that uh, you sent on December 29, 1945 to uh, your mother and dad? Mm -hmm. This is dated December 23, 1945. USS Bowie at sea. You mentioned in here that uh, today is the ship's anniversary. So far, the officers, uh, it will be a big day. So for the officers, it will be a big day. Enclosed, you will find two programs. One is the officers with the best dinner menu, and the other, the chiefs. We eat somewhat like the chiefs, but we get no anniversary cake. <laughs> one, of, one of the bakers asked to make one for the crew but was given the answer, quote, absolutely not, by the supply officers. So you can see how much we rate. <laughs> now that was pretty representative of the uh, attitude? Yeah. Of the galley yeah. cooks? Yeah, I, uh, I had a pretty good in with almost every department. I mean, I, if, uh, you know, if, if I wanted a big tin of ice cream or if I wanted something special from the bakers or if I wanted uh, something special from the guys in the galley, I always got it. I was uh, in charge of the ship's laundry, and when we would go on Liberty or anywhere, uh, and a lot of guys wanted their blues pressed, or, and uh, I would do it, do it for them. Yeah, I wasn't supposed to, but I did it. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned before where the captain had a uh, uh, a ship pulled in and there was a, I, I want to say the guy was like a, an, ad, no, it wouldn't have been an admiral, maybe a, a uh, uh, someone lesser than an admiral came uh, came aboard. He was a friend of our captain's and the captain had him over for, for I, I assume for drinks uh, on the ship. And at one point, the captain's orderly came down with a, uh, this, this other officer's coat and wanted to get it pressed. And I told him, I said, can't do it. He said, what do you mean you can't do it? I said, we're secured. So I gave him the jacket back and about 10 minutes later, the division officer comes down with the jacket and he wants me to press it. I guess he couldn't imagine why I turned it down. I told him, I said, well, we're secured. We're not supposed to turn presses back on until 
you know, 0700 in the, in the morning. And uh, so he said, well, that's not okay. He said, here, would you please turn the steam on and press this jacket for the, I kept thinking he was an admiral, but, but uh, I did it. Here's another uh, quotation that I'll read from uh, your letter, Tom. It says, while back in Guam, the chaplain bought a $350 radio and phonograph combination for the officers out of ship service funds. The chaplain or captain? The chaplain. The chaplain? Okay. It was it brought, bought it out of ship service funds. It was supposed to be a gift to the officers from the crew. We never knew a thing about it. One of the crew asked an officer about it and he was told, it's none of your business. <laughs> Keep your GD mouth shut. The more I stay on this ship, the more I hate certain officers. In this war, the enlisted man was nothing. It was an officer's war and any enlisted man will tell you that. So with some officers, if they're man enough ever to admit it, well, I only have about six more months to do, so I guess I can stand a little bit more of it. Uh, th there were some good officers aboard that I, we liked, we all liked. There were some bad officers, that, you know, the, uh, the, the captain we had of that ship, F.L. Durnell was his name. I'll never forget his name. And then his, uh, his uh, uh, I don't know what to call him, but he was his assistant. He was next in command. This was Joseph G. Ensensperger, Jr., who I have never forgotten, and a real great guy, great guy. Uh, and and, and uh, G.W. Amiot, when I was on one of the uh, duties during, uh, if we were in our in invasion, or in, in this, I was on the, uh, uh, a, uh, there were four stations that we were had when we, when troops were debarking, and this Amiot was head of that uh, uh, station, and I was on the I was on the phones from to the bridge, and, and whatever he, he wanted to say to them or they wanted to say to us, they'd say through me on the phones, and uh, he was a great guy, you know. I mean, we could officers weren't allowed to talk to us during the day or stand around really? and chit chat. No. They were not allowed to talk to us. This was come, this came from the captain, uh, and there were, I'd say, seventy-five percent of them were good guys. The other twenty-five, uh, are, I won't use the expression usually used, but they were, uh, they would uh, whatever uh, the captain wanted, or they were they were just afraid to speak up. There were a lot, a lot of officers that were not. And this Joseph G. Ensensberger, at one point he got, he got transferred, and I have to believe he got himself transferred because he could not get along with the captain. He just, he just, he was not a, uh, you know, just not a, somebody that you could like. Well, being on board ship myself for about two years, I, I think your percentages are very accurate. Yeah. <laughs> 75% you like, the other 25% probably nobody liked. Yeah. Here's another quote, Tom. <clears throat> Mom, I might as well tell you the truth about the money you sent me. Oh. I spent some of it, in fact, most of it, and I have only $45 to my name. Being that our ship is close to decommissioning, I think I had better hold on to all I have, for I may get a chance and I don't want to send home, I, I may get a leave and I don't want to send home for any more money. So will you get Pat and Charlie something nice for their wedding for me? Also we might be out around Dad's and Connie's birthday and I would like you to get something nice for them too. From the looks of things, it doesn't look as though I'm making such good progress in saving for my automobile, does it? I guess I'll never get it. <laughs> I used to have 
a big part of my pay every month sent home. Because uh, you couldn't spend it out there, and, and I couldn't let it ride, but I didn't. I just had, I forget how much I used to send home every, uh, every payday. And my mother would keep it for me. That letter was uh, December 23rd, 1945, Tom. Okay. And then we moved to your mother's letter, if I may, to you from Cincinnati, dated Tuesday, the day, May 8th, 1945, which was uh, armistice in Europe. It said, Dear Son Thomas, this is certainly a momentous day. I believe the Cincinnati has taken it quite calmly. There have been crowds in town Noisy maybe, but daily. I have been listening most of the day to the radio. First to President Truman at eight in the morning while getting the children off to school. Then I heard Churchill, King of England, Eleanor Roosevelt, different commentators from New York, San Francisco, Guam, and the cheering crowds on our own city at Fountain Square. When Helen, looks like humor, got to work, they told her she could have the day off. Helen Cantrell, that Cantrell. Was my sister. Walter Jr. stayed at home from school on the promise that he would get a lot of work done. I think he bought the lawnmower down in the back. Said the grass was too high to cut and then quit. Yeah. <laughs> I believe that. He is out practicing now. Just was called to the phone. It was Helen Schott yes. Hilberg to wish me a happy anniversary. It is something to hear B-Day on your anniversary. Your father just came in and is going to take me for a ride. Can you comment on that? Well, uh, uh, that was a treat back then. I mean, for us hmm. kids uh, on Sunday to go for a ride in the car out to the country and maybe get an ice cream cone or something when we got, you know, got out there and then you got back. But to go for a ride in the car was, uh, was a real treat. And for my dad to take my mom somewhere in the car, go for, just go for a ride, she enjoyed that. She says that your dad and I took a ride but could find no place open, so we were back home at 10 o'clock. We expect to take a ride tonight. We rode out <laughs> to Hop Off Inn and Roselawn, Lovett's Food Shop, and the Marion Food Shop. They were all closed. Yeah, I remember those places. Hop Off Inn was out, it was in Roselawn. But by the uh, Roselawn Tavern. I don't know if you remember that or not. No, I don't. Okay. Do you remember what vehicle they had then? What? No, my dad was in the used car business then, and it, it could have been anything. She also says that Helen, Helen Louise yeah. and I planted a flower garden in one of the terraces. She did the digging and I the planting. That is a hard job. I was exhausted when I got back into the house and I ache all over today. Jane Ann stopped in at 10 o'clock to wish me a happy anniversary. She has the kennel girl, Colonel girl? She has the something girl, Pig Peggy, staying with her while Gay is gone. Gay has this girl helping in the hospital instead of boys, and I believe she is quite satisfactory. Jane says, since Gay is gone, she sleeps with an empty pistol and feels very safe. <laughs> wow. Yeah, Jane was my, my oldest sister, and, and Helen was about, about the fourth girl down the line. There were nine of us in front of my family. Yeah. says she would be scared to she would be scared to death with a loaded one. 
I don't know why she... Isn't that a laugh? Yeah, I don't know why she uh, even did that. I didn't, I didn't think things were that bad. <clears throat> I'm listening to the radio while waiting, while reading, while writing this. All of the programmers are still in celebration of V-Day. Mostly hymns and sermons and commemoration reviewing what happened yesterday and the reactions of the people today here and abroad. I do think the people realize we still have a tremendous job to finish and will give all of our support to end this war. I believe our war bond drive now in progress will be more than successful. We do now believe that this is the beginning of the end of the war and are looking forward to its ends and your return home. I know it won't be that, way, that easy and soon, but at least we have been given hope and encouragement. Let's see the dimples and glad, <laughs> and glad that curly hair has decided to stay on for a while. Love from all, <laughs> affectionately, your devoted mother. <laughs> yeah, she used to, her letters that she wrote, they were, in, some of them were anywhere from four to six pages or more, almost a story, everything she had to say. She uh, always had, you know, remarked about my hair. I, had, I did have a lot of hair when I was a little boy. And when I get a haircut at the barber shop, they'd have to use the thinner to, to cut my hair because I, it was so thick. And I had curly hair. My brother Walter, she even let it go down to my shoulders at one time. And my brother Walter had bangs. Really? You know, it was like this and then down, you know, like that. It looked like the Dutch boy uh, <laughs> in the paint commercial. And uh, so the two of us, we got like, we got in a closet and got a scissors and I just clipped the, his hair and wherever I could clip it and he'd do mine so my mother had to take, take me into the barber shop and, and get a haircut because it looked so terrible. And I didn't like it. I didn't like the curly hair. This would be an appropriate time to introduce a, a really stunning photo of you in your Dixie cup or your sailor's hat. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned earlier that there's a certain appropriate way to wear that. That, uh, that is the salty way. A finger, a finger above the eyebrow. Uh, eyebrow. Mm -hmm. you, that, that is not considered, uh, and I, I, I noticed there I had a tied uh, neckerchief and that was not uniform. You couldn't tie your neckerchief and your hat had to be square and not cocked. When you were you know, at an official uh, uh, you know, captain's uh, uh, thing, uh, top side. Inspection. Inspection, yeah. Could not tie the neckerchief. No, it was, it was not meant to be tied. wonder why that was. It wasn't uniform. They, they really? just never had, uh, yeah, they, never, they had a certain way you had to dress. Well, but, that certainly is a great photo of you at age. I was 18, 19, 18, then 19 maybe. Years. Yeah. That's terrific. Next, we're going to jump ahead to July 9, 1945. And uh, your mother starts out, I'm sitting here with Mimi? Nini. Nini. My sister Nini. Nini. She was the baby of the family. Listening to the radio. Connie went to Peggy's last night, so we are here alone. We are recovering from Connie's slumber party. She had seven girls beside herself. They were up until four in the morning. I had to tell them to go to bed. They were laughing and yelling, playing jokes and dancing. This modern age is just terrific. <laughs> I sure do not approve of it. They were up at eight in the morning, had to get them breakfast, then lunch. Miss Loretto. Miss Loretta. Miss Loretta. Yeah, Loretta Food Shop, Paddock and Reading Road. Do you remember that place? You don't know, it wasn't there then. When I don't. Okay. Fixed them a beautiful sandwich tray. After lunch, they all went to town to see a show. Mimi inveigled me into taking her to town 
So Jane drove us home. We did some shopping. We talked with inter, her into getting her to a show. It was Laura. I thought it was okay, but I don't care much for shows. Walter tried to take me into, talk me into letting him drive us home, but I thought the bus was safer. Walter was my brother. <laughs> he, 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 and uh, I guess he was driving then. My mother was one of the first uh, women in Cincinnati to get a driver's license. Really? Yeah, she, she, my mother did drive, and then finally my sister Jane started to drive, and my mother quit. Peggy never did drive. Never? No, she just wasn't into driving, didn't care. What age were you when you got a driver's license? Fourteen. Fourteen? Yeah. I was, I was driving before. I used to get in the cars on the lot, you know, and drive them around. And, and I don't know why. I, I that was did. a valid driver's license, yeah, state of Ohio. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I went over to Beecher Street to where the police station was on Beecher Street there in Walnut Hills and uh, had an appointment to be there. My dad and my brother Jake went with me. And a policeman came out and got in the car, sat alongside me. And uh, as we were driving, you know, when you wanted to make a, a left hand, right hand turn, you held your hand like this. And when you wanted to turn left, straight out, and down was slow up and stop. Well, I put the window down to do these things, and the officer said to me, put that window back up, it's too cold out there. <laughs> so, so all we did was drive around the block, back to the police station, and I got my driver's license. <clears throat> Your mother goes on to say, we had a quiet Sunday yesterday. As usual, Jane left Cooper and Gail That's here. Son and daughter. And while they went to eat, Connie had turned into Cooper's nurse now, and he has taken quite a liking to Connie. He cries when he sees me. Your father went after Peggy and little Joe, Jake and Jean, stopped in with Kluska. Ed Kluska. Ed Kluska. Ed Kluska. Did you and know his Ed? wife. Well, I believe he was the coach at Xavier right, University. Right, yeah. yeah Ed was, uh, he went, went to Xavier University, and he was from the Pittsburgh area. And he, he didn't go home often because, of, you know, the cost to get there or what have you, he pretty much stayed at Xavier, worked his way through college. That's how he got a college education, because he didn't have, the, he or his family didn't have the money to pay. And uh, so my mother, he sort of was the tenth Sweeney. Every mm. Christmas or every uh, Thanksgiving or when someone had a, he was, he was bef he befriended my brother Jake. He walked uh, what it all, way it all came about with his association with us was he would he walked from Xavier University, which was two blocks from Reading Road, up Marion Avenue, which then passed our house, and then Jake was selling newspapers at the corner of, uh, of uh, Clinton Springs and Reading Road, and Ed got a paper. And then they start talking, then they became friends, and Ed eventually came over for dinner, and he was like one of the family at that time. Well, he was a pretty young guy then. He was, yeah. Early 20s or so. Yeah. And he was at Xavier for a long time. Right. Maybe 10, 15, 20 years. Right. Yeah. Very well-respected well man. Right. Never, you would never hear him cuss or swear. He, he just wasn't that way. But you wonder how he coached football or something and didn't get a few words here and there, but he never, but he never did. She's a, she goes on to say, um, we, sat on the, we sat on the front terrace and talked. They left about 1130. Jake expects to coach Roger Bacon. He will not play football with the Bears this year. Jake and Jean also are expecting a new arrival. I am not quite sure as they expect month. I am not quite sure as the expected month, but I think they expect their baby around January. I'm anxious to see Jake with a baby. 
<laughs> well, this had to be the first then. Which, and I, yeah. I do wish you would write your brother Walter and advise him to stay clear of the girls. <laughs> <laughs> why me? Well, let's ask, why you? I don't know. <laughs> He is still staying out to three in the morning. My goodness. And gives one lie after another for an excuse. <laughs> he is just unmanageable. <laughs> <laughs> Pat, Jake, and Jean are driving to Battle Creek to see Charlie. They're going for the weekend. Charlie was here again this weekend. He looks much better now. Yeah, Charlie was in the Army and he lost a leg. Oh my! And he got a, he got a, a, a medical. And even back then, I think he got a. Uh, they gave him a car that was equipped to to drive without you know a leg. Uh, but he yeah he he was he was in the army and got discharged. Charlie's last name would have been Buck. Sweeney Buck. Buck. A cousin? No 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 that was her Charlie Buck. My sister Pat married Charlie Buck. That's who she's talking about, Charlie, right? Yes. And he, yeah. So Pat and Charlie lived in Battle Creek continuously, I guess. Well, they, he had the job that he had, I forget who it was with, happened to be in Battle Creek. And then she says, well, Tom, <clears throat> no more news. Miss you terribly. Wish you were with us every Sunday, but maybe God will be good and Stop this terrible war and send all you boys home so life can start anew for everyone. Peace and contentment is all anyone needs with love for each other. When you have that, your heart is full. Love affectionately, your devoted mother. That's very beautiful. She, she wrote some beautiful letters. And like I say, she must have written me almost every day or whatever. And that, that has to be the one I wrote her. This is one you I wrote tell, her. I could tell from the paper in the back of it. <clears throat> this letter is from you to mother and dad, Tom. It's dated Wednesday, July 10, 1945, aboard the USS Bowie. And it's on United States Navy stationery. And you start out by saying, Dear, dearest, my dearest mother and dad, our mail has been held up somewhere, so I may not hear from you while here, but that's no reason why I can't write. Mother, do you remember a while back when you said I was a jackass, so to speak? Well, now I'm convinced of it. It so happens that I bought a monkey for $35 oh. from a passerby. Yeah, and the cat made me get rid of it. Can you give us the detail on that? I, I don't remember how, how, where I got it, uh, but I got, got it and had it aboard ship. And then the captain found out that I had it and I had to get rid of it. He wouldn't allow it. What port would that have been in? It's out in the Pacific somewhere. Somewhere? Yeah. I can't imagine me paying $35 over a monkey. But I guess That's I, a month's it, pay. I didn't, I didn't get that much back then. See, I used to have a, I used to have a, I'd buy a war bond every month with my, my pay. I'd, I'd have it taken out. And I think I wound up keeping for myself, spending money a month with like $13. That'd you know, give me, what, 50 cents a day? And you say that, uh, quote, today I was told by the captain that it was not permitted aboard. Mm -hmm. So I had to get rid of it. And I just lost $35, just like that. It was a very cute little monkey, and maybe someday I'll learn. I got another one when I got home. I, I did get one after I got married, got a monkey. A monkey? Yeah, see my mother, when she was little, somehow had a monkey. And I guess that's why she allowed me to get it. And I got a, I got a monkey, then I, I didn't want, you know, I got, I got a ringtail capuchin, and I ordered it from a place in New York. And the, the more you paid for the monkey, the smarter he was supposed to be. So I don't think I got the smartest <laughs> one. <laughs> I didn't want to you know, put out some bucks. 
And after a bit, I got lost interest in it, and I let my sister Nini have it, you know. And what happened after that, I don't know, but I had one on Rose Hill when we lived there. Did you have a name for it? Can't remember. I'm sure I did. And you go on to say, instead of calling this place an island, you might as well call it a trading post. <laughs> These people would rather trade than take your money. I'm missing a jacket, a pair of dungaree pants, and a shirt. Someone probably traded them off. One fellow got up this morning to find his shoes and his clothes gone. <laughs> Some native is probably uh, sporting a pair of shoes of his. Ensign Rothman, one of our officers, knows of Stanley Osherwitz, who lives on Winding Way. Yeah. The Osherwitz are in the matzo business mm -hmm. and his uncles in the meat business. I happened to be talking with Ensign Rothman about the girl he is going to marry. I thought it maybe she was some relation to Milky Finkelstein. Millie Finkelstein? Millie Finkelstein. Oh, yeah. yeah, he, uh, there's, a, there's, it was a Dr. Osher that I went to for something here in Cincinnati. And I asked him, because I'm Stanley Osherwitz, I said, you know, was your name Osherwitz? And you just cut the wits off. See, so he, he wouldn't, he didn't give me an answer. So probably was, but he, but Dr. Osher was a, I think he was an eye doctor that I went to. I had the occasion to know uh, one or two Osherwitz from the uh, Cincinnati Athletic Club. Okay, well, this is the Cincinnati place. Eye Institute, is what, That's it. Which, yeah. which, which, which he was with. You say that uh, you dated Millie once or twice. Then I told him where I was from, and he said he spent a vacation in Florida with Stanley. Ensign Rothman is from New York. Dave went on Liberty today. I didn't get to go because I'm not in the same section as he, so my time will probably come tomorrow. If I were still here, if I were still here, period. You won't let Helen forget the pictures of Dad, Jake, Hugh, O'Hara, and other salesmen, and I, will you? See, Hugh O'Hara, his sister's the one that married Ed, Ed Kleska. Her maiden name was O'Hara. And Hughie O'Hara was in the automobile business. Also, I'd like the one of Dad and Mr. Connors instead of Dad's office, outside of Dad's office. Say, did Walter get that camera? Maybe I had sent him a camera, bought one, sent it to him. I don't know. And then you say, how's everyone at home? It won't be long before Walt, Connie, and Nini will be starting back to school. I should be getting my book soon. It's to be Ameri American History. That's a book that apparently was What I started to do was, I, did, I wasn't able, I didn't graduate when I went into the service. So then I start taking courses through the mail and uh, then when I got home, I went to, uh, I think it was Xavier, and uh, then, I had, then I had to take my uh, high school exam and I took to get my diploma, and that was at Roger Bacon. And uh, Father, I uh, hmm, can't think of his name, he was, head of the uh, athletic, he, he took care of her, was the priest that was assigned to the athletic department. And when I went there for my test, my te to get my diploma, he says, Tom, he said, here, you can take your test in my office. And he said, if, uh, if you don't know any of the answers, there's a book right there. <laughs> so I don't think I needed the book, but he, he was a great guy. Isn't that terrible? I can't think of his name. Well, that's the way they treated servicemen then. Yeah. Great respect. Yeah. <clears throat> well, and then you end by saying, well, mother and dad, that's about all for now. Take care of yourselves and give my love to all. So until later, 
your loving son, Tom. Your last letter that I have here is uh, dated August 17, 1945, aboard the USS Bowie. And it starts out, Dear Mom, after writing the last letter to you, I received two more from you. I know then that if I wrote, you wouldn't hear from me any sooner than now, so I'll put all news in this, this letter. Sure wonderful to hear <coughs> that the war is over with the Japs. Everyone must be much happier. I know I am. When we heard the news about how many points Navy personnel need to get out, everyone was figuring out their points. We need 45. I have 19, but points won't get me out, for I believe I'm in till June of 1947. Of course, that may let me out before that. Of course, they may let me out before that, but I don't think they will. Being that I'm going to be in so long, I'm trying to get rated second class. It will pay more money, and that will be all the more for me to bank. I hear that they may stop our sea pay in six months or less. Sea pay is $20 a month, presumably of what we make. Excuse me, it's 20% of what we make. It's an addition. If I get second class, I may, able, may be able to make this loss up. See, they used to have sea pay. If you were in enemy waters, you got paid more in a given month. So at the end of every other month or whatever it was, we used to call it the uh, income tax evasion run because in, and runs are really benefited for the officers because their pay was much more so we, we figured it was something that so every every other month we'd go out at the end of one month and be gone like a day or so of, a, of an upcoming month so that would be two months that they you know got sea pay for them really we were out but not at sea so we used to call that the officer's income tax run. That's a good name for it. Yeah. They benefited the most. With, our, with the little pay we got, we didn't get that much. You go on to say, we heard over the radio that gas rationing and others will cease. Boy, it's going to be swell to pull into a gas station and say, fill her up. Of course, I did. I was a long time since I was in a car, so it didn't make much difference to me then. I'll spend most of my money on gasoline, and if I get a leave before my discharge, if I get, and if I get a leave before my discharge, they may turn this ship into a merchant ship in six to eight months. If they do, I'm going to try and get shore duty at Great Lakes. But all of these hopes will probably fly right back in my face. And then you say, how's dad doing in selling autos? Fine, I hope. Say, if he's making so much with his business, tell him I'll relieve him of some. <laughs> tell him his money. I hope to be able to be as successful as Jake and dad have been in the auto business. Yeah. Being a salesman for dad is the only real job I'm looking forward to. I haven't much more to write about, so I'll sign off. Give my love to dad and the family. So until later, your loving son, Tom. That's delightful. Why don't you tell us the story about how you uh, were released from active duty or intended to be released released from the ship, I should say, the USS Bowie. You transited back across the Pacific, and then? Yeah, we came back, uh, went through the uh, Panama Canal, and uh, we were actually in, in the Pacific, but, but went down through the Panama Canal up to Norfolk, Virginia, and uh, that is where I got off the ship. And then I, I think I got a month's leave 
and I had to report to uh, Great Lakes. And then I had like three months, four months to go. And then they sent me all the way out to Seattle, Washington. Bremerton, there's in Bremerton, they call a naval base out there. Yes. So I spent three months out there, then they sent, look, released me and I could go home. And that's where that, uh, there were a couple of brothers that were, that I, we, we became friends and they, we bought a car together and that was a 1932, I think, Hupmobile. And uh, some, on the way home, we threw a rod and nobody would, nobody wanted to fix it for us. So we could just jacked the car up, dropped the pan, and pulled the whole piston out. See? <laughs> and went on without the, took the rod out. We didn't know what we were doing, but we thought, well, if the, if the rod had to come out, it's gonna, we'll, we'll get it out. Best I remember, I was the one that did it. And uh, so then <clears throat> driving back from there, uh, we had to put all the windows down because it, a lot of smoke was coming up through the floorboards. Your floor, floorboards were all made of wood. And, you know, you just you choked to death, so you had to. And at night it was so cold, every blanket, every piece of clothing you had, you put it on so you could keep going. And then they lived in Minneapolis, and when we got to where they lived, then I got a train, got a, a train ride home and went into uh, that station down there, uh, uh, Winton Place? Winton Place. Winton Place. There was a train station there. On Spring Grove Avenue. Right. Yeah. And I got off there and then caught a streetcar and went up Mitchell Avenue and then got off where there was a cut through from Mitchell Avenue to uh, Beechwood to Rose Hill. It was like a circle and this part over here was Beechwood and up this part here was Rose Hill. And as I was going home, Walter, my brother Walter, came running down and he was late for school. See, so he came down, he came down to Mitchell Avenue and then ran down Roger Bacon's at Mitchell and Vine. But he stopped to say hello, welcome home. That's about it. <laughs> he was in a hurry. I, I do, I still remember that. But that's the way we got around as kids. My children don't believe me that we, you know, we didn't get a ride to school. We didn't get a ride home. It was raining or snowing. You, these two feet got you there. So you finally got home and you used to carry the key to the house. I had a key to the house. I had a key, uh, and, and which was mine, was given to me, or I went out and had one made. And uh, I still had the key when I went home. And uh, so when I got there, I, I guess we're getting to my little dog story. I, when, we, when I got home, I put the key in there and, and as I was unlocking the door, I could hear my Dixie on the other side making all kinds of dog noises because she knew it was me. What kind of dog was that? A little Boston Bull. Boston Bull Terrier. I have one now who we named, I named her Dixie. And she's, I have her now, she sleeps with me. And uh, so when I got inside the second door, she jumped up into my arms. She was so excited to see me. My mother never, you know, she said, Dixie's still looking for you. Every time she'd write me, Dixie's still looking for you. She doesn't know where you are. But then, then when I got there, she jumped up in my arms and she died. She had a heart attack. She was so excited to see me. And I buried her in the backyard. And she's the spitting image of the one I have. I have a picture where I was with her on the front lawn and about four, three or four of her pups, she had some puppies. And uh, uh, I look at the picture and the markings on the head and everything else are almost identical to the one I have now. But she, when I left the house, when Sean picked me up, uh, she was there looking at me, you know, because every time I, wherever I go, she follows me. I can go into the bathroom to go to the bathroom or I can 
go and get a shower or I, wherever, she's right there with me. And uh, so I turned around and told her, I said, you be a good girl, Dixie. I'm just going somewhere with Sean and I'll be back. And she just sat there and looked at me. But dogs have an you know, unforgiven love. I mean, they just, they're just full of love. Mm -hmm. And they want you to love them. And that's all they want. They just want your love. Well, so now you're home and you're back in the automobile business, presumably. Right, yeah. And then how did you get involved in uh, the reserves again? And well, Korea, wasn't it? Something I'll never forget. Andy Mihos, who was a lieutenant over at the, at the uh, uh, training station there at, at Gilbert and Victory yeah. Parkway. Yes. Every time I would go down and, and uh, you know, if I took a title, we had to get a title in a hurry or something. So I would, I would maybe run it rather than, you know, have the t t title people pick it up. And every time I'd go down there, Andy would say to me, you know, Tom, why don't you join the reserves? He said, you'll meet some people and you'll, and you'll uh, you know, sell them some, maybe sell them some cars. Well, I really, as I look back, I think there must have been a drive on, drive with this thing with Korea that they knew it was coming up or something, there might be a problem, we're gonna need some people. So they, they were out recruiting. And of course, Andy was, was in at that uh, training station. And he, like I said, every time I went there, he's talking to me to join, join, join. So I did. One day, September the 11th, not September the 11th. Uh, I, yeah, September the 11th. What and, year? Uh, 19. 50, I think it was. 50, yeah. 1950. And, and then 9, June of, uh, June of uh, 51, I think the war broke out in, in Korea, and June the, June the 25th or something like that, I was gone. And I went up, he had to go to, to uh, the training, up back up to uh, the training station in, in Chicago. Great Lakes. Great Lakes, yeah. That's where I went the first time. Mm -hmm. But my poor mother, she just thought I was, she didn't think I was going to come back. So I was lucky oh. enough to come back World War II. Of course, Korea was nothing like World War II, but it was still a war. Tell, they, tell us about that. Yeah, they called it the Korean conflict. And, you know, and my, my saying is, you know, tell, tell the guys that got shot and got killed there that it wasn't a war. And, uh, but it just, things happened so quick as far as me uh leaving that uh, uh i just i didn't have any idea i was going to get assigned to a ship that you know right away and i didn't have any idea that i would be leaving that quick but i did and uh at the time i was dating my wife and uh she was my grade school sweetheart and uh, we were, weren't thinking it, we, were, we knew eventually, I got, in, we, I, got in, I came home and I got, I got an engagement ring and Christmas of that the year before, uh, came home and, and uh, gave her a ring and uh, we got married uh, at the destroyer base in San Diego, March the 13th. 19, I guess it was 51. 51, March 13th. And... Uh, so you were assigned to a destroyer? No, no, I was, I was aboard a, a USS Ajax, AR-6, a repair AR ship. We, we repaired, and I think I was telling you about a, it was a battle wagon that lost its reduction gear just on the outskirts of Korea, out in the ocean there. And we had to go up and repair it right at that point because it couldn't move, it couldn't, you know, it couldn't, it's, its reduction gear went out. I didn't know much about a reduction gear, but I knew that's what it was, and, and we were there to repair it. And, uh, but I, uh, I, I was just a little, little uh, surprised how, how quick things happened. What? Was your job or billet aboard the Ajax? I uh, was in the uh, in the ship's laundry. Ship's laundry. Which I was in on in, in the uh, USS Bowie. 
I was originally on the deck force in New Bowie, and I, I thought, well, if this is being in the Navy, chipping decks all day long and painting, I don't want any part of it. And they, they announced over the PA system they needed somebody with laundry experience. So I, I used to work on my own clothes and iron and everything back then. And so I, well, I was up to the office and told them I, was, I had experience in a laundry when I was you know, home. So I got the job and I was put in charge of, I don't, I don't know why I got it, but in charge of the laundry. And that's, that's how, how I got involved in it. And then of course, then when I could call back, that's when they, did, they needed somebody. It, so wasn't, it wasn't difficult. You were in San Diego the duration then? No, no, no. Well, no, when, no, I was aboard the ship and then when I came back, uh, I was, yeah, I'm trying to think. We, the ship came, well, no, I was, the ship was still over, over, overseas in the Pacific. And it came time for me to go home and they said, well, you know, you can go home on your ship. Mm. I said, no, I said, that was, I was supposed to go home six months ago and I'm still here. I said, I'll get transferred. I choose, chose getting transferred and going home on a hotel ship, as they called it. Mm. And uh, so I got off and, and, and went home uh, on this, I can't remember the name of it, it wasn't that important to me at the time. But I, I wanted to get on my way home. That took you to San Francisco or San Diego? That took me to, um, San Francisco. And then you or, made no, it home. Or, or Long Beach, some, I forget where. You didn't buy another Hupmobile. I don't know, I don't, I didn't. <laughs> to get back from the West Coast. And I don't recall how I got home from there, but the quickest way possible. Well, uh, do you recommend this uh, experience for other young men like yourself today? Possibly, yes. I think, you know, like my, my uh, grandson, Mike, who's in the Marines, he's, he, he, he is an excellent Marine. Uh, I think the experience uh, is, is good for any young man. Uh, if you're not used to taking orders or don't want to take orders or a little hard to handle, they, they will straighten you out. And I, I, think, I think it's a good experience. I like the Navy, and that's why I joined. I didn't want to go in the Army or the Marines, so I picked the Navy. Well, it's a great service. Yeah, I, I uh, don't remember any bad times. I mean, bad times, you know, when I got a call back, and, or didn't get called back, I joined, that was my own fault. Uh, but the best thing, like I say, came out of it was I got married. Sure. And uh, all I can remember were the good times. The bad times was leaving. You know, I didn't want to leave. It was mighty tough uh, leaving her in Los Angeles and, you know, knowing that, and not knowing when I would see her again. That and she came back to Cincinnati? Came back to Cincinnati. While you were gone. Yeah. And of course, my father-in-law at the time, was, you know, she was a Hawks, Hawks Buick. Uh, he didn't want her to go out to California and get married, but she made up her mind she was going to come out and we were going to get married. And uh, he told her, he said, well, Joanne, he said, you go out there, you're going to get married. He said, you're going to come home, you're going to be pregnant, you're going to have a baby, and all, sure. all those things happened. You know, how he, like it took a mastermind to figure that out, see. But uh, our youngest daughter, Kathy, was the baby, the first, first of nine. First of nine. Yeah, I was one of nine. So it was, uh, but it was good to get out and good to get home. Well, if, unless you'd like to add something else, I think that this interview could be concluded. Okay. And on behalf of the uh, Library of Congress, the United States Library of Congress, and the Veterans History Project. I'd certainly like to thank you on behalf of all Americans also for your extremely loyal and dedicated service to the United States. Well, thank you the for United this States opportunity. Day. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Same here.
Thank you. Thank you.